good morning good afternoon good evening to all the participants from different parts of the world uh, we are really excited to have this uh, round table on urban air mobility a first time a discussion happening in the country on this topic so uh, as uh, uh, most of you know indian cities are very very congested and also very very polluted in fact 16 of the world's 20 most polluted cities are in india and the, the most most polluted being our capital new delhi where we are located and 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 uh, the travel time from uh, one point to another point particularly from airport to city core or to uh, important business districts in the cities have uh, become so difficult impossible from delhi to bombay i can reach under two hours by plane from bombay airport if i have to go to the south bombay where the government offices and the main businesses are there it takes more any time during the day it takes more than two hours and in the worst case it can be even longer and the other area is some, some places called new mumbai which is on the other side of uh, bombay and that that is equally two to two and a half hours uh, by road any point in time similarly bangalore you all hear about bangalore as the it capital of india they are running the it for the whole world from the large offices and call centers and uh, it sp parks thus they are all quite far from the airport delhi to bangalore flying time is two and a half hours but from bangalore airport to the electronic city where many of the our IT giants are there, it takes uh, more than two and a half hours. At times, it can be three hours. It's that bad. And same is the situation in Delhi, from our Gurgaon to city center or the government headquarters in Delhi. Many times, it can be hour, hours and hours of ordeal. So that is one of the major driver. And uh, there are many people. I mean, I, we have hundreds of thousands of people with paying capacity who don't blink an eyelid if the price is $100 or $150 or $200 for a trip from uh, Bombay Airport to South Bombay or from Bangalore Airport to Electronic City, those kind of UAM services if you can. In fact, Bangalore to Electronic City, there's a helicopter service that's much more expensive. Uh, at times, they operate that or, or charter, people charter can go. So, if there's a regular UAM services, it would be very popular among the people with paying capacity. They save time. And we firmly believe that we'll be able to operationalize those such services. And uh, as all of you know, China has one commercial service. They started uh, by Ehang in 2019. And many countries in the world <sighs> had, were issued uh, licenses during 2000. 20 to conduct pilot trials, which didn't happen because of uh, uh, COVID. We hope in 20, including Uber Elevate program. So we hope that 21, 22, may all those trials, helicopter trials and other things will be successful. And on the technology side, there are no major impediments we see. And why India Smart Grid for our industry is that this, all this, uh, uh, Drones, both passenger drones and delivery drones are going to be running on electricity with batteries, high performance batteries, which will get connected to the grid for charging it. So electric vehicle and the drones, everything at some point in time will get connected to the grid and we'll have to see how our grid will be ready to support UAM services. And we are collaborating with the different uh, stakeholders, technology providers in uh, undertaking studies on that uh, dimension and uh, as far as civil aviation authorities in India are concerned we had some uh, program in 2018 based on which a, a unmanned aircraft system uh, roadmap was issued in 2019 which allows drone uh, uh, unmanned drones applications uh, for, for uh, mapping for monitoring law enforcement uh, if we in our power system we use drones for monitoring of the electricity lines overhead transmission lines and overhead distribution lines which has been done successfully and uh, also space images being utilized for such things so <clears throat> now uh, 2020 
after the covid the law enforcement agencies started using uh, drones more extensively and there was a need for a new law otherwise everything is uh, 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 controlled by our old aircraft rules 1930 1956 and all that which are pretty old so the the, the obstruction clearance is uh, some 500 meter or something you can't go anywhere near a building with a helicopter or uh, so we we tried doing that for washing insulators on high voltage transmission lines in uh, 20 years ago so first thing was to change air, aircraft rules that will take years in the parliament to do that so we, we never could do any, any such things successfully but now in this new era where uh, uh, the drones are going to be <clears throat> deployed for all these applications uh, government wants to change the draft aircraft uh, unmanned uh, air, 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 unmanned uh, air, aircraft system uh, rules which is issued by director general civil aviation has so, several uh, very strict uh, uh, provisions which uh, they are uh, inviting comments from all stakeholders and we hope the final version when it comes it will be much more user friendly for passenger drones and uh, <clears throat> we we are in discussion with the uh, dgca and we uh, we will request all stakeholders here and also to write to uh, dgca that it, th- this has to be 21st century rule it will it should be more uh, passenger friendly or oh, sorry uh, uam friendly rules so uh, with that uh, background i i like to uh, invite uh, john kowalski from nasa who has kindly consented to chair and uh, this session on uam systems in uh, india and uh, many other important uh, uh, dignitaries are or experts from different uh, domains are here in this panel today and we would uh, uh, can i have their uh, no the slides but yeah we yeah. just project the slides yeah so uh, as you can see john had a very illustrious career spanning decades uh, on the aerospace industry particularly in nasa and and the research center <clears throat> so uh, yeah so previously he was director of the airspace operations and safety program where he led overall planning management evaluation of uh, ARMD efforts in foundational air traffic management so he began his nasa career at the ames research center in 1989 as a technical lead and research manager for aero thermodynamics addressing research and development challenges in hypersonic propulsion and thermal protection systems he also served as a technical manager for aerospace programs at the office of the center director at a ames research center and has published more than 25 technical papers so he has uh, mechanical engineering degrees from um, mit and also doctorate from uh, uc berkeley so we very, very privileged to have uh, you uh, john and uh, i welcome all other uh, eminent speakers here christian eschmann who is the acting head of lab at german aerospace center we have shika who is managing director of bangalore metropolitan transport corporation uh, we have andrew hadley from euro control we have kanika tekriwal who is one of the young entrepreneur uh, and co-founder of jetset co and we have anil chanlia who is a, a passenger drone researcher <coughs> enthusiast we have mr yakisi an independent consultant from turkey uh, mr kanishka aigwal from amazon Uh, mr rohan verma chief executive officer of map my india and sadish jamagadagnani from uh, reliance geo and kaniga kalra an urban transport expert and acting director at the uh, institute of urban transport and we have kavitham raj from niti ayog a warm welcome to all of you and i with this i hand over to john you could uh, introduce each of the speakers as you call them out for speaking but you could start with your presentation first good <clears throat> rajit yeah, thank you so very much um uh 
going back to my the early part of my career in, in hypersonics and aerothermodynamics is really <laughs> really dating me. Uh, I've been working the airspace uh, and the air traffic management and the operations for for so long. It's uh, it's nice to be reminded that I used to do some uh, uh, some hypersonics research. Um, at any rate, thank you so much for the for the kind words. Thank you for that very informative inf uh, introduction. Uh, to this space, and I, I'm also very pleased to be part of your inaugural session on um, urban air mobility at this conference. Very impressed with your uh, your smart global uh, digital perspective um, on on these opportunities, whether it be smart mobility, smart grids, smart networks, uh, smart transportation. Um, I'm uh, again very, very impressed with uh, the the drive that you are doing as as a nation in India to try to take advantage of these things. I I did listen to a uh, presentation that that you and uh, uh, Bindeshwari provided this morning at a at another conference here in the in the United States, and very struck by the fact that you laid out a future 2035 future for your country, where uh, if I get this right, two thirds of the buildings that will exist in 2035 have yet to be built. That opportunity that you have in order to bring this this infrastructure future for advanced air mobility, for urban air mobility, is ripe and present. I mean, your ability to to really move aggressively into the future over the next decade or two. Uh, is, is tremendous, and I think this conference is an example of the way that you are viewing this. So again, thank you for the invite. Uh, on behalf of my colleague, uh, Dr. Paramel Kapartikar, uh, who I'll mention a few times here as kind of the uh, the originator of the UAS Traffic Management System, or UTM, um, I'm happy to talk about what we're doing here at NASA Aeronautics. You'll notice on this one cover chart, um, uh, it, NASA's Advanced Air Mobility uh, is the, the title for this talk. Um, we are expanding the perspective of uh, urban air mobility to include a uh, an advanced air mobility title because uh, air taxis are a um, is certainly a great opportunity. Uh, the need that uh, you know, Reggie had indicated in terms of avoiding traffic, avoiding pollution, and saving great time uh, is, is a key driver. But there's so many more opportunities in terms of uh, of delivery, in terms of search and rescue, in terms of uh, you know health and and community services, and a variety of even regional transportation for areas that don't have the same airport service that we thought that this advanced air mobility title was a little bit more descriptive. So we, we put things together in terms of that context. Um, if we could advance to the second slide of my deck, please. Um, I'm not seeing them on my screen. That doesn't mean that uh, they aren't up, but uh, so, the, the, my second chart, uh, where it's titled you, end and air. You want us to project, or you, you have the right to share your screen? No, no, I, I'm okay, sorry. Uh, Akshay, is yeah. doing, no, no, Akshay is doing. You can see the, it. Very good. There you are. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, unfortunately had some tech difficulty. So, Akshay was going to be doing it. Um, so, Akshay, are you on the, the second chart now, end to end air transportation? Let me let me speak to the um, to the topic anyhow. Uh, yeah, next chart, please. Thank you. I can see the cover chart. Next chart, please. Um, th this chart is speaking your language. It is speaking exactly what Reggie was was referring to: the fact that uh, urban planning, transportation, multimodal interaction between air and ground uh, is a a huge opportunity that the urban air mobility or the advanced air uh, air mobility uh, challenge space it can address very very uniquely. Uh, certainly, it offers opportunity to deal with novel propulsion and configuration systems. These aircraft, uh, whereby electric propulsion can be utilized to a much greater degree, also uh, supporting um, you know you know greener aviation and greener opportunities. 
uh, but clearly those uh, potentially quieter, more energy efficient vertical lift vehicles um, offer opportunities for you know future impact of transportation you know and benefit to society. Um, certainly, again, urban planning is is key in terms of you know being able to locate businesses, housing, uh, and and urban centers um, you know in places that allow us to access them much more readily. Um, and you know the the future of aviation, a, a three dimensional approach to moving people and goods, uh, is uh, is better for for business and and for our, our housing and our overall development, and certainly the uh, uh, the the impact that that has that Reggie had laid out just a few minutes ago is, trem is a tremendous opportunity for India. If I can go to the next chart, please. Um, this next chart is what we refer to as an OV1, an operational V1, um, whereby we, um, we identify that wide variety of opportunities that our view of advanced air mobility defines. I mean, certainly you can see the the air taxi view, you can see the air ambulance and, and public service view. Uh, but we also believe that with these much more capable aircraft where uh, 100, 200 mile range uh, becomes possible with the right uh, you know, electric propulsion characteristics allow for greater ur uh, rural services uh, and rural to urban engagement uh, that um, again open up a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous safe and sustainable and affordable uh, access to aviation that can transform uh, local and uh, intra-regional uh, you know, uh, neighborhoods and uh, and communities. Um, you'll see in the upper left-hand chart uh, section of this chart a a UAM urban air mobility maturity level definition. I'll talk about this more uh, a little bit later, but one of the things that we appreciate is the the importance of a uh, crawl walk run approach to development um, there are a lot of key technology challenges which i'll talk to over the next few minutes uh, that are important and needed in order to be able to access uh, these capabilities but what we want to be doing is finding ways in order to bring them uh, to fruition in steps, allowing value to the community as they're brought forward and allowing us to learn and grow in terms of those capabilities and the technology maturation. Uh, if you can go to the next chart, please. Uh, in order to do that, we have identified uh, what we refer to as our NASA AAM mission priorities. Uh, you'll see in this chart these five uh, blocks that are representing five key areas of research and development we think are necessary in order to bring urban air mobility to our, our communities. In the red at the bottom, you see uh, activities that are focused on the importance of building these vehicles, finding certifiable vehicles that are able to perform these missions. Uh, so individual vehicle and fleet noise uh, issues are, are key to being able to provide these vehicles uh, you know, for their use new propulsion reliability and uh, and energy sources on board, batteries and the like are critical, and you know the environmental uh, conditions uh, that are important to, to do that as well as uh, you know failure conditions around these new technology things that have to be researched. Certainly we to provide scalable services here on the lower right, automated flight and contingency management, higher levels of autonomy are going to be vital in these vehicles in order to be able to do that. Um, on the blue boxes in the upper right and upper left, uh, we refer to the airspace barriers. Uh, these vehicles need a safe and efficient airspace in order to fly. Um, the, uh, you see XTM architectures on life. XTM is referring to extensions of Dr. Kopartikar's UTM concept, uh, which he had developed largely for smalls in lower airspace, a very low altitude, but we, we have the opportunity to extend that service-oriented architecture uh, to higher altitudes that can enable these UAM and AAM missions. Certainly operational rules and communication nav and surveillance information is going to be critical, uh, but it also opens up, you see on the far right blue box, this opportunity for service-oriented delivery and uh, it, taking advantage of, of 5G networking 
to be able to have service providers, not a unified service providers we have in the US with our FAA, but those that are working for in-time aviation safety and, and data management and trajectory management, fleet management in a much more vertical way. Um, and then uh, also the, our, our fifth priority area is the, is the localities and the national acceptance challenges. Um, again, you folks appreciate that so well in India as you are looking to build out the, the necessary infrastructure to allow these things that you know, these uh, missions to take place. Vertiports, uh, local and national acceptance is going to be critical. How we do that in terms of community integration is a big, big challenge here. Um, we, we see systems and architecture requirements as key enablers for this, but we also are developing a national campaign. A national campaign, uh, which I'll describe a little bit later as well, uh, are allowing us to take these uh, this maturity of uh, our uh, urban air mobility maturity levels and building them up into more and more complex um, I'll refer to them as kind of like, you know, um, uh, test beds, uh, you know, sandboxes in, in which to, to play with our community that will allow those test beds to be proving grounds um, in increasing maturity to be able to get that data on, on performance and continue to improve that as we go forward with, an, with a, a large national campaign over the period of a decade. And again, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit more later. Um, go to the next chart. I'll take just a minute or two here to talk about um, uh, you know, the, the vehicle side of this challenge, uh, as well as the airspace side, starting with the vehicle. Uh, the, we don't build vehicles at NASA. We don't market anything. Our job is research. Um, and we work with our larger uh, aviation community, the, the, the vehicle and the OEM community, in order to develop those, that, those capabilities. But what we do is try to reduce risk. We do reduce risk around the technical issues that are critical to being able to build certifiable vehicles in order to perform these missions. Um, so, but as a result, uh, what we seek to do is to develop these concepts that essentially serve as technology collectors that are critical for the kinds of missions that UAM vehicles are, will be needed to perform. So you see a variety of these um, uh, these reference vehicles that you see in blue on the right hand side of this chart that are identifying a number of different opportunities and sizes that can address a number of the missions that could be of value uh, as the community expands. Um, and among the things that these vehicles uh, feature in terms of technologies are, you know, the electric, dis distributed electric propulsion configurations where battery or hybrid propulsion characteristics are, are critical but uh, quiet, high efficiency rotors and, and wake interactions, uh, you know, wing rotor interactions are all critical elements of this that these vehicles illustrate and provide us an opportunity to do modeling and research uh, that will allow these things to, uh, you know, to provide um, information to, the, uh, to our manufacturers, to our partners, to, to, again, reduce risk and be able to develop their own version of these capabilities as, as we go forward. Uh, you know, design and analysis, uh, tool development, technology trade studies around these sizes and, and scalability and, you know, modeling operational scenarios are all part of this. Uh, you go to the next chart, please. Um, what those, that is clearly doing also is identifying key research areas that need to be uh, pursued uh, among all these variety of, of concepts. Um, you know, Akshay, if you can just move to the next chart, please. Chart six. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, they, the, the needs are vast, whether it be in areas of propulsion efficiency, safety, airworthiness, or uh, specifics of uh, multidisciplinary aircraft design, structures, noise. All of these things are vital. Um, and frankly, they're not all listed on this page. So it's critical for us as a, as a research entity to try to identify those items that we think are primary interest, primary value, and, and you see those in red. These are the ones that we in our research portfolio are taking on firsthand. Um, we, there are some others in blue that will be picked up as we reduce risk and uh, reduce the uncertainty in those areas listed in red. Um, but bottom line here is that many problems, many research and technical challenges 
we need to bring the entire community together around how we do this and how we bring these capabilities to fruition. This is where you know the importance of uh, activities like this, conferences like this, to bring the multiple players, not just from any one country, but from the globe, that will allow us to understand um, how to uh, you know, reduce the technical risk uh, and allow for certified capabilities and, and missions uh, that can be supplied by, by vehicles that are produced by our, our manufacturing communities and ecosystem. Um, so again, much, much to do here. And again, this conference is a great example of the way in which we're trying to uh, come together around those missions. Uh, next, please. Uh, you could advance the charts, please. Um, one thing that is, is a key item that we need to all keep in mind here is that the, we get very excited about the vehicles, um, and we, we should. They offer you know, tremendous opportunity in order to bring value, um, and, and value is, is, is met you know, in, the, uh, in the flight deck and in the passenger seats of, of these uh, in, incredibly new vehicles. But nothing can be operated. We have nothing unless we have an airspace system uh, that is ready when these vehicles are ready. Um, in order to be able to uh, w drive these missions of, of urban air mobility. Sorry, if you could back up one chart, please, Akshay. Um, thank you. Um, in order to be able to engage in some of these uh, complex, high-density uh, uh, missions, in order to have autonomous vehicles or highly automated vehicles that are in the same airspace as manned aircraft, those uh, human systems interactions all need to be worked and worked effectively before we're going to have a safe air transportation system taking into those vehicles. Um, so this is one thing that needs to be driven early um, and right alongside the vehicles so they are ready together for that, that opportunity. Next chart, please. Um, enabling that future airspace operation involves a, a tremendous number of, uh, of, of drives. Planning for that future, that UTM-inspired air traffic management and building off of, of Dr. Kapartikar's vision, which is digital, cooperative, sharing of that ascent and these, these service-oriented architectures which allow for you know, service provisions around trajectory management, fleet management, weather tolerance and, and weather observations are all a key part of that which UTM offers. Uh, it gives us a chance to revisit flight rules uh, where electric and digital intense sharing is a much bigger part of that. Uh, revisiting roles and responsibilities among pilot and operator uh, or automation and operator. Uh, are enabled by these future airspace capabilities, as well as you know, revisiting separation minimum. Uh, when we are not uh, dealing with the more straightforward three-degree glide slopes to arrivals um, and, uh, and Mach 0.8 uh, travel en route, as we are with our conventional aircraft, but we should be thinking very differently about how these new capabilities of these uh, uh, electric VTOL and vertical lift allows us to think about safety in terms of different separation minima, all part of an airspace challenge. Uh, reducing weather-induced delays by you know, proper management and, and weather sharing, um, getting uh, societal benefit from that right engagement of local and regional operations in ways that allow that to be done safely. Uh, disruption management, uh, around these digital services is going to be a key element, as well as that architecture uh, that links automation, the roles and responsibility of human and machines, all needs to hang together. These are the critical elements of that, you know, that future airspace that are going to be essential to, to making this work. Um, go to the next chart, please, and I'll, I'll wrap up in just a couple minutes here. I don't want to shortchange our, our speakers. But I, I talked about our UAM maturity levels, or the UMLs. Um, uh, the, the NASA team in the Advanced Air Mobility Mission have thought very carefully about how to get to these end states. Certainly, if you look at this chart and you look down at the bottom part of it, that mature state, uh, our higher UMLs, our five and six, where we have highly automated or autonomous operations. We have high-density complex operations 
with highly integrated networks in and around cities, and it's ubiquitous. We want to get there. But how do we do that? We have to do this in a way that allows us to take stepwise improvements, enabling some capability uh, that will then allow us to, to learn and grow. Um, so UML1, uh, where we're looking at uh, ability to provide some early certification testing and operational demonstrations in very uh, risk-reduced, limited environments that allow us to learn what, what are those key safety challenges we have to address in order to go forward. UML2, get into lower density and a little bit more complex commercial operations, not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, passenger carrying at early stages with some level of decision support and automation, followed then by more medium complexity in UML3 and, and medium density, higher complexity in UML4. Being able to do that over what we're anticipating is probably a this decade of the 2020s will allow us to make the case for the, the safety and the validity of these operations where vehicles, airspace, and the community challenges come together around that solution. Um, and sorry, if we go to the next chart, please. Uh, what we also appreciate, though, is that if we target that UML uh, one through four change where urban missions and passenger carrying vehicles and their operations are the the key focus that will that is the larger challenge the bigger challenge uh that will uh you know you know, unlock the economic benefit but it will enable uh more rural risk reduced missions along the way there's much that we can learn from operating in in cargo only configurations or in more uh, regional air transportation lower density uh, you know, higher, uh, higher safety margin areas um, that will, again, provide that value. So urban missions drive the key technical challenges. We flesh them out there, but be able to find rural missions that will allow us to, to manage those things very effectively. And then my, my last chart before we, I want to turn to our, our panel is the importance of uh, what we refer to as the ecosystem and coordination. Again, reflective of this particular conference, of pulling together um, many folks uh, within India, but also across the globe to understand and develop a connected stakeholder community is critical to this. It's critical because it allows us to align on a common vision or, or a common set of missions that, uh, that we, we find value in and we wanna drive. It allows us to collaborate on research uh, and plan transition paths so that things don't stagnate, they have that, that transition opportunity to provide value. Uh, we collectively identify and investigate these key hurdles and barriers that will allow us to unlock that. We develop system and architecture requirements, uh, all of that supporting regulatory and standard development, and ultimately adopting a strategy for engaging the public. Because it's the public that needs to see the value, that needs to accept that and, and build the market uh, and the opportunity here for providing that value back to, to all that we do. And again, to, uh, to Reggie's point earlier, uh, providing uh, the ability to relieve some of our, uh, our environmental challenges, our, our density challenges, and all that, uh, that are so critical here. And bottom line, we want to work collectively with this larger global ecosystem to accelerate the development of safe and scalable flight operations uh, you know, bringing together this broad and, and diverse collection of people. So that's my last chart. I have one more, uh, the, my get off the stage chart um, uh, is just a, a vision of, of NASA looking out beyond the horizon. Uh, we know we need to do that with you all uh, and with the, the global community. Um, and I'm very pleased to have this chance just to give you a sense of how we're going about doing that and uh, elements of our time frame. So. Thank you very much for your uh, your interest. And what I would like to do at this point is turn it to our um, our expert panel here for some remarks. Um, again, in terms of our the uh, the AAM focus here, um, I think that so much of what Reggie said and laying out, you know, establishes the need and the the opportunity for our, our folks to uh, to talk about their interest in this area. But um, 
what I'm, I'm hoping this discussion over the next hour or so is going to reveal is some of the learnings from our, you know, the global practices uh, and regulations that we are all facing in our, our individual communities, uh, reflections on the technical feasibility of the UAM in their vehicles and the airspace uh, that may have applications in metro areas. Um, you know, what is that commercial viability as we each see it from our own communities in terms of, of moving passengers, that ultimate goal? Um, infrastructure requirements are going to be critical to that. Environmental impacts of these vehicles yeah, and overall safety measures. So uh, let me again turn it to our, our community here and um, and give them a chance to reflect on, on that and some of the things that are going on in, in their uh, from, from their knot hole. So let me start off with, with Christian. Um, if, if you could, um, I, I believe you have some charts that uh, you'd like to uh, be speaking to and taking mm -hmm. five minutes or so to, to reflect would be great. So over to you, please. Thank you very much, John. Um, let me just see if you can see the charts. Actually not. Not yet. Keep trying. <laughs> we'll be patient. <laughs> Screen now. Not working. Um, I th something is happening. I don't see them yet, but oh. <laughs> John, can you still hear me? Christian, if if you have difficulty, please uh, mail it to us. We will project it. I I think uh, Akshay, do you do you have Christian's charts? It's I not think with us yet. Maybe earlier. You you can mail it now. We will project it, and you can start speaking. Very good. Yes, if we can do that. Throw it out. John, can you still hear me at least? I do not. I, I can't see them on my screen. Um, are others seeing them? So if, if you could you just perhaps move to the to the next speaker and I just jump in afterwards. You know, once I handle the, the, the we, we could do that. Um, so, Christian, how about if we do that? Can we um, move to to Andrew next? And we'll come back to you yes. once we. Okay, let's do that then, uh, Andrew. Thank you. If good, we can go, good and morning. again, if, if you can take just a moment to a you know, quick introduction, um, and then uh, to your material, that would be yep. great. Okay, so uh, you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Okay, so my name is Andrew Hately. I work at Eurocontrol, which is uh, I'll introduce in a moment. And I'm a senior researcher in uh, UTM and UAM subjects in the Experimental Center, which is located on the southern edge of Paris in France. So I have some slides. I want to try to give an overview of the research position um, in Europe. So let's see if I can get this to come up. Do you see my slides? Yes. OK. Do you still see my slides? <laughs> yes, I do. Right, okay, so just a quick overview. As, as John very nicely introduced the subject, there are really three big questions in urban air mobility. Economic, is there going to be some kind of business in all of this? Technical, can we build a vehicle? Are the comms good enough? Can we make a detect and avoid system? Social, that's, that's uh, kind of the crucial one is... Um, under what conditions will society step into these vehicles or will they be happy to have them flying over their heads? And one of the key uh, outcomes of this social consideration in air, air traffic control, we refer to the target level of safety. And achieving the target level of safety requires many considerations to be met. One of them is operational. And the question is, 
how do we add these flights to an already busy airspace? And that's the interest of the organization I work for. Um, and that's where I will focus this, this uh, presentation. So just a quick overview of Europe for people who are less familiar. Europe has, the European Union is an organization with 27 member states. So these are distinct countries and each country is sovereign over its airspace. So there's no possibility to have European Union constructions. Uh, it's a national business about flying. But the European Union members follow certain common regulations and, and ways of working. And one of them is the separation of regulation and service provision, for example. The European Union has two agencies which are concerned with aviation. There's EASA, the European Union Aviation Safety Agency, which regulates things like vehicles and it writes rules about how flying is done. And there's a thing called the CESAR Joint Undertaking, which is a collaborative uh, public-private partnership for research. And this is a mixture between the European Union, industry, and Eurocontrol, the organization I work for. Now, Eurocontrol is a pan-European intergovernmental organization, which is providing services and support to European aviation. It dates back a very long time. And one of the things that we do is air traffic control. That was actually the original intention. It would be like an FAA for Europe, but times have moved on and we are now a kind of supporting organization. We get involved in pan-European questions and we do research among other things. There's also a larger body, which is um, the European Civil Aviation conference which has 44 member states which is kind of the the greater european picture our aim is always to meet the needs of that that group so what have we done so far utm as it's known in the usa is referred to as u space in europe and we have been working on u space for a few years now uh, we defined u space as having four levels a bit like this this uam maturity levels but perhaps a bit cruder and the um, research so far has focused on levels one two and three level one is implemented now under european law and level two uh, the law which will drive that into deployment was signed last week so uh, it will appear publicly in the next few months and it takes effect at the beginning of 2023 research is ongoing on how to do u3 and U4, and U3 involves things like tactical conflict resolution and things like that. What's going on with air, urban air mobility? So we're at the research stage. Uh, there are six very large demonstrations going on, which will look at current state of the art and what is needed to push it further. These six projects can be found on that web link. You can find details of them. And they um, really focus on what uh, John referred to as the higher UAM maturity levels. Our, our concern is how do we get to the stage where we can allow unpiloted operations and thus make uh, rely on features of, of UTM or XTM to support that. The other thing which has happened in Europe is there has been a regulation passed for, for allowing the vehicles to fly. Uh, and this is an enabler, uh, but um, still a great deal to do. So I'm going to talk very briefly in one page, if it's going to come, yeah, about one of these, um, one of these um, uh, demonstration projects. It's a project which I'm the technical coordinator of. 30 organizations are involved, including Christian's organization, DLR. We will make <clears throat> six demonstrations of flying in urban areas and around urban areas, peri-urban areas, intra-urban flights. These demonstrations will cover seven countries. The flights will take place in the summer of 2022. And as I say, the focus is looking on how U-Space or UTM will support urban air mobility operations. And there's a little web page you can look at. And the state of the art in Europe, we're not flying yet. We see a path to piloted operations under existing rules, flights as VFR or IFR, 
probably in dedicated corridors and using extensions of current legislation, no, no need for anything groundbreaking. But our aim is to get to remotely piloted operations. And we see that as being done with the support of use base. And that's what we're currently researching. So that's a quick overview. Um, I hope I've introduced myself and back to John. Andrew, that was fabulous. Thank you. Um, let me, um, get a lot to unpack there and look forward to doing that as part of our, uh, our, our Q and A as we, we finish up here. Um, so Andrew, let's go back to you. Have you, um, are you, are you able to speak to your, I'm not, I'm sorry, Christian, I go back to the top of my list. Ah, Christian. Yes. <laughs> please. Are, are, are you ready to, um, to, to yes. show your chart now? All right. Oh, Great. Action. We'll make it because it seems that I was some bandwidth problems and was not able to share it. But now okay. after Andrew, it's even easier for me to step in <laughs> because he really okay. provided the ground to do so. Um, yeah. So in the meantime, when, uh, when actually I was uh, bringing up the slides, um, let me perhaps uh, just introduce um, DNR first because uh, Andrew already mentioned it. Um, as DLR, we are Germany's um, organization in terms of aeronautics, so um, the, let's say the NASA counterpart, and um, we are by far the largest organization in, in Europe, um, with, uh, only for research, let's say 1 billion euros of, um, of funding, uh, with more than 9,000 employees, and of course urban air mobility is at the moment one of these major key drivers that we have in aeronautics. I mean, since decades, we, we were dealing with, uh, let's say, the NASA, a lot of things that is going around in aviation, but um, air mobility really changes also the structure of DLR, as we can see at the moment, because we've seen it in, in John's presentation and in Andrew, it's a really vast topic. It's really um, uh, interdisciplinary, so it's not anymore the classical aeronautical building of an aircraft. It is really uh, something that is highly connected, a really complex system. And um, there we have seen that uh, we even need our expertise from our space fund institutes, from our um, energy and transport research institutes. So really something that is uh, an, an overall package. And UAM is really tackling us um, <laughs> to the boundaries of what we want to do. And we've seen it today in, in the, the presentations before that it is really something um, where we have a lot of things still to do because um, we want to fly in, in urban environments and really dense environments uh, in an airspace that is not here. So um, also at DLR, um, we have these main um, drivers as um, working on autonomy, working on a new airspace um, that is, has to be there and managed. Of course, working on new propulsion systems, clean energy sources, um, that are really filling in the, the, the needs when we have a, a look at the climate discussion so far. So really um, battery electric flying, uh, hydrogen powered flying. Um, and this also together with really new types of aircraft that we want to have, they should be lightweight, they should be cost efficient. Um, they should of course be safe because flying is still the safest way of traveling, but um, we now try to implement a miniature mode of, of what we had so far. And so at the moment, we bring all these challenges together. And if we put it together to one vehicle, to one system, this is the, the, the just um, the little aim of what we, we are going for here. So um, even also for DLR at the moment, nearly everyone is, is uh, somehow involved in this topic of UAM in order and um, there we have seen that base institute from our um, energy and transport as uh, an, an overall package us um, <laughs> to the boundaries and today in, in the, the presentations before that is really something to do because um, we want uh, in an airspace that is not here we have these main so back <laughs> just lost you for some seconds so th that was more literally it um, so far, just as a quick overview of, uh, yeah, DLR. Still there, John? Uh, 
I was on Thank mute you. trying to cut down my background noise. Forgive me. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was here, just lost my voice. Um, th thank you very much. And by the way, I, I love your uh, trophy case uh, behind your head. Uh, it's <laughs> wonderful. It's all your, the, the, your aircraft and the models. That's wonderful. Um, so thank you. Well, that's, I, uh, I have my hobby as my job now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it's nice when you can combine them, right? Yes. Great. Definitely. Okay. Let, so thank you. Let me, let, let's move on. Um, uh, our next speaker, uh, you know, Kanika uh, Terrawal. Um, if you're, um, are you available? Hi. There you are. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry. Good afternoon good from afternoon. India. Yeah. Thank you. So, lovely presentation. Some of the points I think I completely agree with. Some are things which I would just like to put down about India. India, as you know, is a huge population, large number of cities. Congestion is increasing every day. Uh, generally, what you hear and what you see are the mega cities or the larger cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore. You understand there is congestion, there is problem in walking, and all those in, who are Indians over here, they will agree with me. But uh, we are not looking at a much serious and much larger problem, which is going to be there in the next coming few years, is the problem of the small and the medium towns. The congestions are increasing at a much higher pace over there. Registrations of vehicle is happening at a very high pace. And the bigger issue over there is the infrastructure. These cities do not have the infrastructure to support that kind of increase in population and motorization. So these cities are going to face much larger challenges than the mega cities. Uh, UAM can provide the alternative as I see it today working with these cities because how it can provide because uh, where in the lack of infrastructure, it provides an alternative where you do not really need that kind of road space, etc. However, there are certain, there are other challenges which are there in, in implementing UAM in these cities. One is there are no airports in these, there are, I mean, uh, if you want to tie up with, uh, you know, real estate, you develop real estate, as I was saying that we have not even seen half of the real estate, which is going to be there in the next 10, 15 years. Uh, but you please understand these cities rely mostly on a plotted housing or road development kind of housing with not very high rise buildings. So tying up with real estate, you know, to create landing spaces, etc., or or etc. is going to be a problem. Uh, in the overall sector, existing regulations is something which really do not support UAM at the moment in the country. So that is something which will need to be re-looked at. Existing regulations or airspace regulations are only limited to aviation sector as such. So UAM is a completely new arena which has to, will be introduced. There's going to be a greater reliance on IT information technology with the pilot free vehicles or driverless vehicles which are going to be flying all around so that is something which needs to be again redeveloped because it sector as such in the mobility field is very limited at the moment then is the question of the fleet technology i understand some uh, trials have been done in european countries in dubai etc but not much has been done so far in the country. So completely new area, which we are looking at, and this needs to be addressed. However, this provides a great opportunity. I'm not talking about only about passenger movement. Definitely that's an, that's an opportunity, but uh, India has a huge, huge population. So the economies of scale that we were talking about in the previous presentation that comes in over here. So you have huge population to, uh, to you know, feed. Second is, in India, travel distances are growing with new new satellite towns coming up every here and there connected to the main cities. So, uh, that is one opportunity. Uh, it, this provides an opportunity, you know, it opens up an area for, for basically for majorly I see for the healthcare sector to start with, for the car freight or the cargo sector. And thirdly, maybe the agriculture. 
because this can be very useful in promoting rural economy or giving rural connectivity which is in to today even or or the hilly areas india has a large hill area also so providing connectivity in this areas could be a huge uh, opportunity uh but uh business as i was saying in the previous presentation india has a huge population it provides a huge business opportunity so that is not something i would really be worried about but social yes i am not sure or we are not sure how the society is going to take you know uh, you know vehicles flowing over their buildings every few seconds how they are going to take it but yes it this can also help us in reducing congestion reducing pollutions as well as pro providing cleaner air as you know air quality is in india is a big big problem so what i really foresee is something you know from the movie back to the future with vehicles flying all around <laughs> but uh, yes i hope it is there <laughs> very good thank you yeah all we need is the flux capacitor right yes. yeah we'll get that put on on that right away <laughs> yes excellent <laughs> Uh, Kanika, thank you very much. That was that was wonderful. I uh, appreciate that perspective, particularly on the uh, bringing the focus more clearly on some of the small and medium cities and the the challenges they face there, which are just as significant. That's great. Um, so I, I I heard in the chat that um, uh, we want to change the order of speakers a little bit because of a uh, a uh, another. Um, schedule issue that has to be addressed. So uh, let me turn this now to um, you know, Kautham Raj uh, for, for his remarks. Uh, if you would please uh, say a little bit more about your organization and, um, and offer your thoughts, please. Thank you so much, uh, John, uh, for excellent presentation and excellent coordination of uh, the speakers. And there are very, very insightful uh, speeches uh, given by so many different stakeholders having very strong interest in exposure to urban air mobility. Uh, so I am part of an organization called as Niti Ayo, National Institution for Transforming India. I mean, transforming India would, would probably require urban air mobility also. So we are a policy think tank, uh, which, which, which is chaired by the prime minister. And we work with all the, uh, all the ministries uh, and the state governments in implementing, designing strategies and policies for the government of India. In addition to that, we are also uh, the we also chair the national mission for transformative mobility and battery storage, which I which I'm part of. So the electric vehicle policies, electric vehicle schemes, the battery manufacturing scheme, all all of these are led and designed by Niti Aayog and implemented by ministries. So uh, especially on on electric mobility, we have taken a very uh, very prominent role, uh, and because urban air mobility also comes under certain aspects of electric mobility where of course there are so many other uh, components to it like infrastructure uh, uh, information technologies uh, but from electric mobility batteries from this aspect uh, so because we are leading the policy in that space we are also very interested in what kind of applications uh, would, would the sector electric mobility sector would, would take shape in the future and urban air mobility personally i have been a huge fan of urban air mobility because i see a a lot of promise, especially for India, with flat roofs and majority of structures yet to be built. And we are the, uh, we, we, all the vision documents, vision 2035, vision 2040, are usually, uh, for the government of India and many states, are usually designed and coordinated in Niti Aayog. So when we see those numbers, I always feel that there's a huge scope for quantum jump in mobility. I, I feel urban air mobility is not only the future of mobility, it's, it's the future of the way of life. The way we live and interact with the objects around us is going to dramatically change. And India has a tremendous opportunity. And, and I personally have a lot of, lot of, lot of um, uh, hope for urban air mobility, especially in India. And there's a lot of, uh, whenever we talk about urban air mobility, even inside the government and outside the government, that, that has been, of course, the flying cars have, have some kind of a fantastical element to it. And, and people don't really believe that, that this is actually uh, more close more close to reality than what people might expect. And, um, and the, 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 there needs to be a lot of work to be done in, especially in developing countries like India to, to, to advocate that the technology is ready. And, and the challenges are more in the infrastructure and regulations and safety. 
but the technology is ready and flying cars are not not a science fiction anymore and it's, and, and it's quite quite possible in the near to medium term and i i feel from my side where, where i uh, see as part of uh, a small very very small part of uh, uh, influencing the policy in the in the country the biggest challenge would be convincing the regulators the policy makers uh, to, to to believing that the technology is ready that that could be the number one challenge and number two challenge is we, uh, and uh, this this notion also second notion that uh, 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 this is uh, only for the technology for the rich there's also such a notion uh, which exists and i have when i have made presentations on urban air mobility to, to different quarters that has been uh, this is a technology for the rich and and, uh, and lot of numbers and the different agencies do do say that even though initially the uptake might come from a certain segment of the society over a long term urban air mobility definitely has the potential to to support all segments of society uh, so we we strongly believe that and number 3 uh, the, the ability of a, a developing country to to actually take part in this transformative mobility because we are uh, the the niti ayog has the national mission for transformative mobility uh, it, it's the same logic for electric vehicles we don't have legacy infrastructure baggage that other countries have both mm-hmm. in the mobility front we our car ownership is a fraction of global car ownership so uh, so in in that way we strongly believe in the movement towards connected electric and shared mobility which india is going to promote and urban air mobility is going to be extremely key uh, and and another key aspect which people don't bring into conversation is the amount of money india is going to spend in building flyovers and roads india is going to build a huge billions and billions of dollars in in to accommodate the expected rise in car ownership and and at least if urban air mobility takes off in a, in a great way there's a huge potential for indian government to save billions and billions of dollars in 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 infrastructure like roads which you have, you have to build every year especially in countries like india you have to with rains and monsoons we are building roads again and again but when when we have a series of virtual roads because it's just virtual and it's it's, it's all information technology the maintenance cost of these infrastructure the virtual infrastructure are going to be dramatically lower than flyovers and bridges there the, the aspect of huge the, some sort of quantification of amount of infrastructure investment which india would save that would help a lot in convincing the government to, to go to, to, to pivot towards urban air mobility as a viable solution for the future of india across societies for the for, for our citizens thank you so much for for, for your uh, comments and an opportunity to share my views and i am very very um, interested in hearing every everyone other panelists insights as well i'm sure this conference is going to start the conversation and i really congratulate india smart grid forum for taking this excellent initiative excellent thank you so much that was fabulous um uh, john uh, may i request yes, you please. request all the panelists to switch on their camera for a photo opportunity while all are here and please smile okay <laughs> all right thank you um okay uh i'm ray christian kanika kalra two more people would we we have another individual that we we're adding to our list here which would be good i know so we're now up up to 11 i think we're going to be able to get these comments in and again looking Kanika forward Kalra, to more you... people sharing yeah we will see but at least now uh, let's have one photo yes can tech team confirm that we have got the photo up actually you did that, that thank you over oh, to you okay. back to you john great thank you all right um so um i'm ray uh yes sir would you please please and please introduce yourself and um and provide your thoughts please sure thing thank you john uh let me share the screen uh can you see my screen now yes i can yes very good yeah. well uh my name is uh, emre yazıcı and i'm from turkey and uh i'm an aeronautical engineer with a about 30 years background in uh, aeronautics and i have spent most of my time in 
Turkish Aerospace Industries, TAI, you may know. And when I left TAI in 2014, I was the head of helicopter programs there. And uh, since 2017, I'm uh, actually it goes way back, but since 2017, I'm very much involved in uh, unmanned systems and ur urban air mobility subjects. And I am promoting large cargo drones because I believe it's the right step to make the flying taxis, flying cars a reality. I, as I told you, I believe the urban air mobility is the next big thing. Uh, currently, there are over 200 tangible projects going on. So uh, I agree uh, with the other speakers that existing technolog technological challenges are very small or will eventually be eliminated. So uh, technology is here. But the effectiveness of urban air mobility and similar systems require a huge volume. People are talking about 10 times the civil helicopter market. That's very big. So uh, in order to sustain the future of urban air mobility, we need practicable operational concepts, as uh, the other speakers have emphasized. So operational concepts are constrained by cost, safety, environmental sensitivities, social impacts, as well as technical bottlenecks. So I'm going to here to discuss the pros and cons of existing operational concepts. Uh, the challenges in urban air mobility have multi, a lot of phases. We can uh, think it like an uh, iceberg. At the top part of the iceberg, there are technical challenges that we are talking about a lot. Battery density, autonomy, air vehicle configuration, things like that. And we are also discussing the regula regulatory challenges, the certification, airspace integration, and environmental issues. But some of these discussions go underwater. And there is a huge infra infrastructure challenge in front of us. Landing sites uh, in urban planning, qualified personnel, this is very important, continued air routes, charging means, navigation aids, such things are uh, requiring a lot of attention. So, and at the bottom side of the uh, iceberg, there is a big social acceptance challenge. Uh, of course, cost per mess messenger mile is an issue, but noise levels, visual pollution, and safety, of course, are top issues here. We are talking about a never heard before market size. It's too big. At the left-hand side, uh, you see uh, the changing forecasts about urban air, air mobility market volume from 2016 to this year. And at top, there is an automotive market volume. And at the bottom, there is a helicopter market volume graph. And the, I, you have to note that uh, the graph is logarithmic. So uh, current helicopter, civil helicopter market volume is actually around 10, $12 billion a year. And we are talking about $1 trillion or more and down to $200 uh, billion or so for the urban air mobility market. This is, of course, fluctuating right now as per Gartner's hype cycle. And we have to understand, we, are, uh, we have to understand that we are talking about not 10 times, but 100 times, sometimes uh, bigger uh, falls from the existing helicopter, civil helicopter market volume. We are much closer to automotive market volume, but uh, for a proper uh, comparison, we have to understand that when we are talking about UAM, we are not talking about the airborne component only. We are also considering the whole infrastructure issues, etc. So uh, the uh, Airborne component is about 25% of the whole market. And even then, uh, we are talking about 
huge faults, three to 30 times of the current seal helicopter market. This is very huge. And uh, in order to sustain this, uh, this enterprise, we have to have such volumes. Uh, before going into difficulties of uh, the operations, I want to clarify uh, some definitions. When we are talking about a taxi, we are saying air taxis, air things like that. A taxi collects you from an arbitrary location of your own demand and transports you to another arbitrary location that you dictate. It's totally random. It, it should be capable to move from a random place to another random place. Whereas a metro collects you from a fixed predetermined location and provides you with limited possible destinations. So actually, uh, currently, when we are talking about air taxis, we are talking about air metros. Here we have a totally hypothetical city. I named it Hypotuam City with a population of 500,000. There are around 1,000 cities in the world with a population over 500,000. And here in this uh, hypothetical city, we have an area of around 50 kilometers squares, which brings us to a population density of 10,000 per kilometer square, uh, which is typical at the Southeastern Asia, South Asia part of the world. But if we remember that we, are, we will be talking about the year 2035, it will be more typical all over the world. Here, I want to have a simulation kind of simulation of air taxi operations. That is a hypothetical example, of course. I have placed 10 Bertie ports over the city. And uh, the circles that you see are not the only Bertie ports. You have to imagine the Bertie ports to be at the center of those circles. And the circles indicate a three minute, walk, uh, three minute walking radius. Uh, for, for most of the people, it's a limit for walking while from going one place to another that are far from each other. So I take the average flight time as 10 minutes. That's uh, more or less uh, practicable in such a scenario. And you see here that the verti ports and walking distances cover a small area. It's a limited coverage. So for all practical purposes, one will need multimodal transportation systems while moving from one point to the other. And if a taxi or a fleet of taxis, which are forecasted to be 50 or 100 for such a city, uh, current, according to current estimates, let's say, uh, if you're traveling in a taxi or taxis are operating in such a city and there will be 45 network connections among these 10 vertiports. And most of these routes, actually here it's 35, but uh, 75, 80%, all these routes eventually will go over the city center. And if we make a small calculation we are going to see that there will be 200 to 400 crossings over the city center per hour. That's amazing. That's unbelievable. If we simulate an air metro, which is very uh, close to an air cargo operation here, we can identify two server and eight clients, let's say, in the uh, cluster terms. And the uh, servers will very probably be located at airport, seaport locations where uh, stuff comes in go and go out, and people, of course. In, in this scenario, we will be uh, transporting passengers and cargo as well. So uh, the locations of the servers, the red dots, are typical for regional logistic hubs. And if we uh, simulate a cluster structure here, we are going to see much less routes 
are connecting each other. Actually, there are only 18 connections in this example. And out of these 18 routes, only six go over the central. So this makes, this brings us 100 to 200 flights or crossings per hour over the city center. It's still too much, but much less than an air taxi operation. And this is not uh, something uh, small. Uh, in such a scenario, over a 10 hour day, you can hold 2000 tons of cargo or 20,000 people. And these numbers are a bit too much for a city of this size. This means that we may operate much less number of vehicles in a city of this size and still achieve something uh, valuable. If uh, we start summarizing what we have said up to now, we can say that air taxis uh, most likely will operate at lower load factors. Load factor is how many person you, uh, you are carrying in one flight, the uh, ratio of persons you are carrying to ratio of your cap to, the, to your capacity actually, because there will be too much dead returns. Uh, it's very likely that load factors will be lower. It is. It requires a complicated air traffic management scheme because there will be a lot of flights all over the city all the time. And when people are flying in such vehicles, I personally would like to fly in a piloted vehicle. And autonomous or remotely piloted systems uh, will take time to be digested, let's say. And finally, passenger transport is sensitive to mishaps. Actually, in early 70s, there was an air taxi practical, an air metro service in New York, which in uh, 1977 abruptly uh, stopped due to a crash in the city. And, uh, and there were fatalities there. So when flying people, any mishap may be detrimentary. That's very important. On the other hand, while air metro operations share the autonomy and uh, mishap sensitivity issues with the air taxis, they will probably have better load factors because they are operating between fixed points and they will require much less infrastructure compared to air taxis. And their load on air traffic management is less than, than that of air taxis. When we move to air cargo operations, when I'm talking I, about air I'm, I'm Ray, if I, if I can, sorry, just interrupt for a second here. We're running a little short on time. So let me ask you if you could to, uh, to pull your comments together in the, in the next minute or so, so we can make sure we hear from all the rest of the panelists, please. Sure, sir. It's last two Thank slides. Thank you. In. Great. And I'm not talking. I'm talking about. I'm not talking about small drones here. Small drones may be reserved for rural areas, but in city, uh, the value is uh, hauling large cargoes. Air cargo operations has a ready customer base because existing logistic service providers need to reduce time to delivery, need to increase their efficiency. And leading retailers are getting involved in delivery, such as Amazon and other people. So it's all B2B operations, much easier to manage. And it is economically feasible. Actually, all we are talking here, I mean, the air cargo and uh, air metro are economically feasible right now. Uh, air cargo has a smaller infrastructure burden because takeoff and landings uh, may be performed at backyards or retailers with minimum uh, setups, let's say. It's uh, based upon a proven hub and spoke model 
uh, which is very well known by the retail, uh, LSPs. And it means less air traffic management load. It can be remotely piloted from the very beginning because we are holding cargo, not passengers. It will uh, reduce the operating costs because a pilot may manage a lot of vehicles, eight to 10 vehicles maybe. And most importantly, cargo vehicles will be a test bed for emerging technologies and uh, will help us to make the uh, air taxis, air, car air metro operations a reality in a shorter time. And of course, mishaps will affect them public. And final words, since 2017, I'm believing that the large cargo drones are the way to go because they tick every box for a safe and socially acceptable entry to urban air mobility market. They will help us learn and grow as well. This year, Deloitte, for the first time, identified the market share of large cargo drones will be 75% by 2025 and over 50% by 2035. It's necessary to note that large cargo drones have a vast military, emergency medical services, agriculture, and offshore markets as well. It's promising to see EHANG, Volocopter, Pipistrel, and Elor Air, among others, are releasing cargo versions supporting this evaluation. Thank you very much. Great. All right. Thank you, sir. That was great. Thank you. Um, all right, let, let's move on to our next speaker, uh, Kanishka Agawal from Amazon. I think there was a nice segue from uh, Emery's comments into, into your interest, so please. Thank you, John, um, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, that's a pretty Jim Carrey style of saying that, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, th thanks for getting me on this uh, round table, and it's great to always talk about uh, what's coming up next. Are we going to be the next Jetsons on this? Uh, you know, at least at Amazon, we're very, um, very futuristic about this. We're extremely positive of where this is going to take us. If you've uh, read some of our um, you know, recent press that's been coming on Prime Air. Uh, there is definitely work that's happening uh, in terms of delivering packages using drones in less than 30 minutes or so. And we're working with multiple regulatory authorities across the world uh, to make that happen. Uh, now, these packages could be like, like we've classified it in India, whether it's a nano uh, drone or it's a large drone which can carry uh, packages greater than uh, 20, 30 kgs. Uh, we will see you know, where that comes in at. But essentially what we are focused on is on two, is two aspects and the entire urban air mobility, um, uh, which has also been referenced with the DGCA uh, document uh, and on the unmanned aircraft systems uh, draft that was put out in 2020, uh, really calls out two specific things, right? Which is uh, the beyond visuals uh, side and the one that is at visual side. But I think we are most interested on what is beyond uh, visual uh, takeoff and landing. And so the entire VTOL uh, or BV doll uh, that we're talking about, because that's that's key on everything that the previous panelists have indicated. So the congestion that it causes on the air networks, the um, the need for regulators, need for air traffic controllers or drone traffic controllers, as you may have called, uh, that may need to be set up at various nodal agencies. So you could have uh, DTLs that are set up at state level or at um, you know, sometimes even at pin code levels or a group of pin code levels that will require to monitor the movement of these uh, drones. At least the uh, the policy in India is very clear that unless you don't have a, or unless you have a code that actually allows you or enables or activates the drone to fly, it's not going to take off. So it will follow a pre-set path, uh, which has been already pre-decided. So think of it just like you have your regular air. Um, air traffic controller where a uh, preset path is given out, uh, the pilot literally goes through that uh, and lands on any deviation of that is immediately reported out. It is the same way that this will happen here, which will hopefully start bringing in the problem statements of congestion. Uh, well, there will be congestion still, but at least the problem statements of um, are they crashing into each other or are they interfering in other uh, civilian airspace uh, that will go away. Uh, what we are looking at is, and this becomes um, a larger technology problem, which is how can I start deploying efficient algorithms and network optimization um, technologies that can help uh, solve some of this. Uh, think of it, the various nodes uh, that, that were shown by the previous panelists. Uh, if you've got 
say 60 nodes to cover in a particular city or about um, you know 60 part three 60 part four kind of nodes that will start coming up once you get into a larger geographical area which could be the country then that becomes a severe uh, optimization problem which typically you know through regular machine learning or regular network optimization is extremely difficult to achieve uh, and we're seeing that some of these could be large-scale research problems that hopefully someday quantum will solve uh, so we we are focusing on some of these areas. Uh, how do we you know progress that further? Uh, the second uh, the, that was mentioned was how do you have these being accepted by the general public, uh, both in terms of cargo as well as passenger, uh, uh, you know, uh, way of actually flying. Um, I think the what we are also seeing cargo acceptance is much higher. Uh, because, you know, obviously there's no human life really involved. But as you start getting in passengers fl flying onto these drones, uh, the more safe they start becoming, the more regulations that we have, you will hopefully get to a point where these become like unmanned ta taxis. Uh, look at what some of the other biggies are doing. So whether it is uh, Velociraptor, if that's the, well, Velociraptor, Velocicopter, one of those organizations that's actually putting oh, out a lot of drone. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're trying to put out a lot of drone based taxis. Um, Uber has actually put out a plan for 2023 uh, for drone taxis to come up. Uh, so there's you know, quite a bit of exciting work that's happening there. Uh, key will be all of the environmental pressures that they will be under, right? So how do you keep the noise uh, low? How do you keep it within the 45 dB uh, limit? How do you make sure that it continues to be very ambient uh, across the civilian airspace and not uh, infringe upon regular movement that may occur? How do you make sure that uh, the number of people that are actually traveling in have a landing site to come into uh, in various locations? I mean, think of uh, really congested places like Manhattan, right? Uh, if you were to actually start landing in these drones, uh, think of on the 52nd Street, uh, it's going to be a nightmare. You probably will have a launch pad uh, or a landing pod uh, built in somewhere, and then somebody actually moves from there, which is the point of multimodal transport. So this has to integrate with still a last mile connectivity in some regions uh, where we might think a drone is a last mile connectivity. Actually, it could be that I might still need my traditional transport systems to be the last mile connectivity in some regions. And, and finally, uh, you know, wrapping it up is the, um, you know, the whole idea of currently how drones are being used in India. I mean, we saw it during the COVID uh, pandemic response. Uh, drones, especially in India, were being used uh, by the Bihar government. Uh, they were using this to just enforce social distancing uh, for people as they moved in and out of lanes. Uh, so there's uh, drones being used for that. The drones are today being used for aerial surveillance, perimeter control in India. Uh, the Survey General of India is actually trying to explore how they can use drones for just agriculture mapping and land mapping. Uh, so there's a ton of applications that will come off, uh, which are just beyond the urban air mobility what will continue to uh, probably the learnings from these will help the UAM uh, mandate. Over to you, John. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate ending that with that last thought. Much learning we will do with some of these more uh, low risk applications. I think that's a, a, a great way to end that. So thank you. Um, uh, Rohan, let me turn it to you now, please. Thanks, John. Uh, it's really nice to be with all of you. Let me try to share my screen so that uh, I can start the presentation. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. OK, good. So it's nice to meet you all. I'm Rohan Varma, the CEO and executive director of Mapma India. Um, yeah, I wanted to tell you guys five things. Uh, one is, of course, who is Mapma India? We are India's leader since 1995 in digital mapping and geospatial technologies. We've built India's most comprehensive digital map and the most advanced geospatial tech, and we serve 5,000 plus enterprises. So that's one thing about our company. The second, I think now it starts becoming interesting to urban air mobility and the future of the world, I would say. We're building a four-dimensional digital map twin of the world. I think what we mean by four-dimensional is real-time changing three-dimensional uh, map of the world. And I think this is going to be super, super important in, uh, in the world where we are looking at urban air mobility 
Um, so I'll talk about that. The next is we've actually kind of condensed down any precise 3D location, a latitude, longitude, and altitude to what we call an e log It's a unique location identity. Uh, we've condensed it into a six character digital address for every precise 3D location. And I think this has immense, and it can be for any place, any object, anything. Um, I think this has immense uh, application uh, for even drone delivery and other things. Um, the next is we're building mapping and navigation technologies where we're quite a strong R&D and future uh, thinking and advanced technologies company. So our technologies are even looking at, I mean, in the, on the terrestrial world, we're looking at autonomous uh, vehicles, HD maps, high definition maps of the roads. But we're also now starting to think about and starting to plan for how do we support air taxis, air ambulances, uh, drone delivery uh, systems through, let's say, sky maps. Uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, and what are the things needed? Aerial route planning, aerial navigation, traffic monitoring, uh, and fleet management. Um, you know, this is different than, of course, planes. I'm talking about dense aerial urban air mobility. And of course, also, uh, there's a huge part of our business which focuses on location-based analytics, uh, uh, GIS, geographic information systems, which people use for planning, let's say, of infrastructure, as well as for analytics of demand and supply and all of those things. Uh, so, you know, our mapping and navigation analytics and AI technologies are used to enable or can be used to enable urban air infrastructure planning and location-based analytics. And just our kind of introduction or one of the large, uh, you know, roles we are playing in uh, urban air mobility is we are the mapping and fleet management backbone for the digital sky platform that the government of India has, uh, is underway in terms of getting. So these are the five points I hope that you can take away from it. Um, yeah, from, from 1995, we built the entire country's GIS vector map database, as well as geo demographics at a hyper local level to give you context or demographics about any part. But then we've also moved on to three dimensional maps. So different levels of floors of buildings and what we call real view, which is a 360 degree view uh, captured from either the road or which can be captured from the uh, air. Uh, we've also focused on indoor maps or campus maps, again in 2D and 3D, which can support VR and AR. Uh, we handle weather at a hyper local level we regionalize our, uh, our, our maps. We handle traffic today at the 2D level, but you know, soon in the soon future, uh, when there's 3D traffic, we'll handle that. Navigation, ADAS, driving assistance systems for anti-collision or accident avoidance, and high definition maps in terms of LIDAR, point cloud, et cetera. So, I mean, just to give you some kind of feel for this, let me see if I can share uh, my screen again with a video. Um, India's building is so much more than just a regular map. We're building the digital map twin of the real world. It's a map that's so powerful, so detailed, so precise, so real time, so intelligent, and so personalized. that it can serve many use cases, not just navigation. Although just by the way, our navigation is far better than what even the others offer. Over the last 25 years, Mapma India has built from the ground up and far before any other international provider India's most detailed, accurate, comprehensive, feature-rich, and continuously updated maps that cover an unparalleled three crore places, including house numbers and buildings across cities, one and a half crore points of interest across 300 categories of interest, be it shopping or utilities or emergency services, etc. 
as well as all seven lakh plus villages across India, and 99% of India's road network, that's about 66 lakh kilometers. Really, Map India is the most comprehensive map for the country and offers far more capabilities than any other map, helping users be more efficient, safer, knowledgeable, connected, and capable. Map India move. So, so that might give you some idea about this digital map twin. Um, basically. So, R Rohan, sorry to interrupt. I just I want to make sure that we uh, have time to get through our last four speakers here, and we're we're running a bit short. Um, uh, this is fascinating, but c can I ask you to uh, touch upon the highlights of your your next few charts here, so we can make sure we get time for our, our last four speakers? Very short. Then, like I said, thank you. Handle advanced mapping from the terrestrial point of view even from the drone point of view and even indoor. End-to-end um, -end aerial survey to mapping so that the output is a 3D enabled uh, GIS map. Like I said, this ELOC is very interesting. It's a six character code digital address. I won't go into the video, but uh, uh, it should give you some clue about how drone delivery uh, at a floor, in an apartment, in a tower, in a society uh, uh, can, can happen because we actually know the 3D coordinate as well as the routes that can be used to go there. Um, this is our 3D city platform, uh, MGIS, which can be used for urban air infrastructure and location-based uh, analytics. This is what Digital Sky is using. Uh, this is not a, a non-zoomed in view, but you can zoom in to exact levels and you can use it for all sorts of analytics and planning, etc. cetera. Um, these are the LIDAR and other things. I won't go into that. And uh, yeah, I think I'd like to kind of close on that. But these are the five points. I hope people uh, can take that away. And we're really looking forward to kind of accelerating the future of urban air mobility in India. And a lot of the technologies we are building are applicable even for the developed world. Uh, sitting in India uh, with all the best of technologies from Stanford and and, and the UK, um, and from, of course, the IITs and BIPs in India, we've been able to build something quite advanced and looking forward to working with the ecosystem to enable urban air mobility. Thank you very much. Good, Rohan. That was, that was tremendous. I had no idea you had this kind of capability, your 4D digital mapping, the security elements of, of the locations, and the inclusion of weather, something I find very interesting and particularly applicable as we're looking at this urban and mobility markets. That was great. Thank you. Um, so I, I think we want to go now to um, uh, to Ms. Ms. Shika. We had um, uh, skipped over her uh, early in John, the agenda. Uh, she, she's her. still, John, she's still stuck in some meeting, government meeting. So we can move to okay. Kanika Tekriwal. Very good. All right. So uh, yeah, I guess um, yeah, Satish is the is our no, next speaker, is that right? No, no. He, he's, also, he's also not there. He, please invite oh, okay. Kanika Tekriwal. Okay, uh, very good. Thank you. Kanika, if you could, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you for this. Um, thank you. Just to tell you very briefly as to what we do and um, what Jet Set Go is about. We're primarily a private jet and helicopter operator who aspires to be an EV toll operator in India, in the cities of Bangalore and Bombay. In 2000, from 2018 onwards, we've been carrying out various tests in collaboration with uh, three uh, major OEMs based across the world. And what we primarily did was we deployed helicopters for, to enable intracity connectivity across the cities of Bombay and Bangalore by the name of Sky Shuttle. And we actually, this was a very heavily subsidized project by the OEMs to understand what will it take to make EV tolls a reality in an environment like India? And we sold seats. We did a pricing test. We did a um, to understand what pricing best works for the customer. What is the premium a customer is willing to pay to use a service like this? But primarily, our study was more focused on understanding what is it that is required from the Indian infrastructure point of view to make EV tolls a reality. Because the harsh reality right now as we speak is that in, an, in the current Indian environment, 
for a helicopter to take off and land for a 20 minute flight. There are 18 government departments involved and 46 different government permissions involved. For every helicopter to take off, you need the local police to send you an army of police officers. You need the local fire station to send you a fire tender. You need the local health department to send you an ambulance. And it takes almost, I mean, putting it lightly, between 24 to 48 hours to enable a 20 minute helicopter flight. And this is an operation that's being, you know, I mean, helicopter operations have been going on for the last 30 years in this country. And we're talking EV tolls where we want to, you know, have uh, remotely operated machines flying <laughs> over an Indian, over a very claust claustrophobic Indian environment. So I think our primary, le our primary learning, which came out of all this is that, you know, India is a very, very different geography. <laughs> What's going to work in the rest of the world is not going to necessarily work here, whatever the need for in, for EV tolls may be in this environment. And um, I think you have to rewrite the entire civil aviation regulation in India if you really want to make this a reality. And th that is the way it is. And, you know, the customer is willing to spend a premium. The infrastructure exists you've got more high-rise buildings than possible which can take the weight to create stations hubs etc but what doesn't exist is the simple infrastructure of what happens if something goes wrong you know and who is the regulator for this so for example you know if you go into bombay you can't fly helicopter city uh, helicopters over most of bombay city purely due to the naval and army bases that are present in bombay so you have to go around them and going around them means most EV tolls don't have the range to do this or the time taken is, you know, longer than what road travel takes. So there's no purpose of having this EV toll there. So it's not just, you know, working with the DGCA, who is the civil aviation regulator over here. It's working with the army, with the Navy, with the Air Force, with the Ministry of Defense, with the Ministry of Home Affairs for security clearances. And then comes in your regulator called the DGCA. And I think that was the biggest roadblock, uh, you know, the challenge we found. And we had, um, you know, we, we did various tests where we tried to activate a flight in as short as four hours to three hours. To give you a background, we operate a fleet of 28 planes and 16 helicopters with the largest, um, you know, private jet and helicopter area in this part of the world. And despite this army of 400 people working in the organization, purely in dispatch and ops, we were unfortunately not able to dispatch a helicopter in four hours because the various departments that need to give you permissions were just not willing to loop in and do this. And even if you try to get blanket permissions for one month of operations on certain routes, et cetera, that's not permissible. Every day, the ATC asks you to revise your timings depending on some commercial plane whose flight path you're in or some other activity going on, like a defense activity or a maritime activity or something like that. So I think, um, you know, to su sum up the structural challenge in this, because I know we're short on time, I think what, what India as a subcontinent really requires is, you know, a key government department or a key st stakeholder to actually align not just the aviation regulator or not just the prime minister's office or not just Niti Aayog. I'm sorry, <laughs> to just from Niti Aayog here, but someone to actually bring together the 17 different departments that actually control the airspace as, as well as the ground. You know, even if you've got the airspace in your control, you have the municipal department, you have the various government corporations who control movements on land who have to enable this you know i mean something as simple as getting a fire tender you need to put six applications four days in advance and they're not willing to set up fixed fire stations at helipads stuff like that so i think the key requirement for a geography like india to work is you know you have to have all the stakeholders on one page and one regulation where you're not running as an operator to 15 different departments saying please give me this permission please give me this permission otherwise what more or less ends up happening is that You've got six government departments aligned, six government departments not aligned, and finally your project is not taking off. And I mean, from the customer pricing point of view, you know, we ran customer tests where we charged as little as what it costs as an Uber to travel a distance to almost four times the price, eight times the price, 12 times the price. And what we learned was the customer is willing to pay as much as 15 times of what he pays for an Uber in India to use an EV toll to simply reduce his driving time in a city like Bombay from 180 minutes to 20 minutes in the air. Because in Bombay, it takes you about 12 to 15 minutes to cover a single kilometer. So you've got the customer base, you've got companies willing to run this, 
but to make this dream into a complete reality i think a lot more work needs to go into regulation and actually figuring out how are we going to have a separate you know government department or a separate body apart from the aviation regulator leading ev tolls complete that's for me wow thank you uh, <laughs> enlightening uh, here in the us we um, we, we have similar challenges but the the cost of the operation is a much bigger part of it. To, to hear you say that, you know, paying for the service, nowhere near the big issue. It's keep it, you know, being able to get your approval for that flight in anything less than a day or two days. Just phenomenal. All right. Thank you. Very enlightening. Okay. Um, so let, let me double check. Uh, Mr. Naidu, is, is he our next speaker up do i have that right uh reggie uh, hi yes <clears throat> john yeah, good morning yes great good thank you good evening yeah uh, i think uh it's very uh, good talk for me let me introduce myself myself is Odi naidu currently working as a senior principal engineer at itachi abb power grids so basically i'm a power system research engineer but this topic is really uh, new for me and i learned a lot but I would like to put a few things uh, uh, in terms of the Indian perspective, in terms of the business case. At the same time, I had a few uh, comments about the uh, the charging infrastructure, etc. So coming to the business uh, uh, point of view, this uh, urban air mobility is very, very, very interesting. Uh, for example, the city where I'm staying in Bangalore, which is the southern part of the India, there is a place called Electronic City where I am working. If I want to go to the airport, it will take me almost uh, three to four hours uh, to cover almost seven, 70 kilometer distance. Uh, but in 2018, there is a heli taxi uh, service they started and they are dropped within 20 minutes. So it's, 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 it's a drastically reduced the time. But again, uh, the services are very limited, only two, day, two times uh, per day. But still, people are affordable. We are in, we are interested to go for it. But again, the uh, uh, the frequency is not there. Maybe what our team mentioned all these hurdles of the regulatory hurdles. And the second uh, part is that where my hometown. So there is an a uh, beach areas are covering like hilly hilly areas, like uh, a lot of tourism places. Hilly tourism is really really uh, one of the uh, key uh, business. Uh, uh, which can drive this uh, urban air mobility. Because certain parts of the India, there are uh, very attractive places, but there is no proper transportation, either train or maybe a bus. Even, even I saw certain places where we cannot uh, even go for the two-wheeler, but the people can carry the people, like uh, the, 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 so the humans can carry the uh, old people, etc., to reach the certain uh, temples, etc. So where this kind of uh, air traffic, uh, sorry, uh, this kind of mobility is really, really useful. So in this aspect, yes, the technology is really giving, uh, this kind of technology will really enable to explore those kind of business use cases. But at the same time, so again, uh, the many points already covered my, uh, the esteemed speakers already uh, about the regulations, etc. My fundamental uh, uh, concern about this uh, UEM, maybe you can, somebody can clarify me, is it a piloted or uh, autonomous operations, the first part. And also we are claiming that this will uh, reduce the, uh, the pollution aspect, but at the same time, I have a concern about uh, what about the noises uh, introduced by this. And also the, if you go for an electrical uh, population, then how do you go for the uh, charging? Is the uh, grid is uh, enable such kind of facilities today? For example, uh, people are talking about the uh, uh, EV, EV e mobility and all. So again, where to charge? Like like so many uh, is it that kind of technology available? For example, in in Itachi ABB power grids, we had a flash charging, where the bus can charge in a few, within a 15 seconds, and when the passengers are boarding down and during that time, it will charge at the bus stop itself. So such kind of technology maybe uh, could be useful for this kind of, uh, it will enable this kind of charging facilities. So this is what uh, I would like to uh, bring it uh, the panel notice and uh, 
So my fundamentally, is it really help for the environment or not? Still, I am a little bit uh, skeptical because of my maybe my limited knowledge on this topic. Okay. Uh, all in all, yes, this is a really, uh, uh, thank you so much for giving an opportunity to understand this topic. But uh, I'm seeing in terms of the uh, uh, grid prospect too. Again, uh, we need to be changed the grid course. Suppose if we can introduce the flash charging, then again, the regulator has to be agree upon that. And also way to chart, can we go for the wireless charging? Some technologies is developing in that aspect. So th these are the aspects need to be studied even much more uh, cleaner for, especially in the uh, aspect of uh, grid management, power grid management. Yeah, thank you yes, so much, yes. John, for your, uh, your opportunity. No, th and thanks for those, those remarks. Uh, the issue associated with the greenness of these electric VTOL is going to depend upon just how green the grid is, because that's where they're getting their power. Very good point. Plus the the importance of having a distribution of, of, of grid charging sites uh, in all this infrastructure, the landing pads, the vertiports, ports, it, it's not an insignificant amount of energy that has to be transferred quickly and safely. All those things are are vital to making the making go of this economically, safely, and affordably. So thank you. Very, very good points. Okay. Let me um so thank you. I I think uh, maybe help me enough to get this right. I want to get back to uh Kanika uh Tekrawal. is is she is, is she one of our last speakers now? Is that correct? No, Anil, no. Anil I'm, Chandler. I'm sorry, Anil. okay. So Okay, so Anil, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm trying to follow the chat. My, my apologies. So Anil, if you could you know, please provide some, I think you may be our last speaker for this panel. So you know, look forward to your remarks and, um, and, and take us home. <clears throat> Thank you, John. And thanks everybody uh, for uh, giving us this opportunity to come and speak on this platform. So we, uh, PDRL Passenger Drone Research Private Limited, we started this company with the vision to create more time to leave for the people. We understand people in different cities of India, and they have to spend at least three, three to four hours every day uh, for commutation. And uh, out of their active hours, uh, they are spending a lot of time, I mean, three to four hours in just commutation, which they don't want to spend. And how can we reduce that? And we understand that this problem will be there because of uh, three primary reasons. One is continuously economy is going to increase, that will increase the number of vehicles. Second, population will increase. Again, that will increase the traffic. Third, existing cities cannot be modified drastically. Therefore, we need this kind of solution. And the same thought, we developed the prototype of eVTOL uh, a couple of years back only. We developed the prototype and then we were uh, taking that prototype to various investors and then thinking about multiple aspects of getting investment and all those things and overall scenario perspective. However, we face a certain challenge uh, as Mr. Andrew uh, and other uh, rightly speak. I think it's not about the challenge of technology. It's about the challenge of acceptance by the uh, regulatory uh, body, right? Even today, uh, companies like uh, Volocopter, they're flying their machine from last nine years. And as a company, uh, as an entity, how many years they are going to fly their machine without you know, having any revenue model and knowing that at what time they're going to generate money out of it, right? So uh, it is necessary for government and rest of the body to really come together and try to address the challenges of this particular industry because if some companies for, uh, is there in business without any revenue model for a decade how long they are going to be there one day they will start shutting down and all the people who are talking here about the future about the benefits advantage may not be there because if there are no people to put money to develop the machines or uh, vehicles certainly then nothing will take off right I understand uh, government is really working hard, uh, primarily in India, like uh, we have a department, DGCA, Department General of Civil Aviation. They came up with a first draft of CAR, uh, Civil Aviation Requirement uh, for uh, drones in 2018. And now it's 2021, 
and still uh, we are find finding lot of challenges uh, to fly remotely piloted aircraft machine that's the drone with the uh, in line of sight and now we are due for the beyond visual line of sight trials and this effort is being made from last one and a half year so uh, if it is going to take years and years just for trials and for getting things or uh, you know actual operational certainly it will have a bad uh, commercial impact on companies who are trying to stand and you know contribute into into this particular uh, area so government is trying hard uh, like there is a uh, regulation called npnt which is fantastic regulation uh, which gives or as a guideline it will be giving all online permission for drones to fly so even no paperwork will be there it will be really on uh, online system so that kind of things are coming up but certainly uh, we expect uh, more speed so that uh, all the people who are trying to stand in this industry uh, can you know leverage that thing and they can serve the community that's all from my side great anil thank you very much um all right i think we have now completed our our list of speakers uh, let me let me apologize <laughs> Uh, as I um, was trying to make sure I didn't miss anybody, and I, I'm afraid I got some of you out of order, but thank you for your patience. Um, yeah, and it was a tremendous, tremendous set of speakers. Um, uh, Reggie, uh, over to you, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for uh, conducting this session very meticulously and uh, very differing views on technology, regulation, uh, ec uh, economic uh, or uh, willingness to pay, all this we have touched upon. So, well, uh, young lady is completely already uh, uh, this, uh, heartened by the long delays in getting approval. So I am still optimistic we'll be able to do that. We'll be able, able to do that maybe in next two to three years. So uh, the, this current government, which we have, particularly our Honorable Prime Minister, he is a very tech-savvy person. Anything new, he personally intervene and get things done. So... Uh, Parallelly, in another hall, we are talking about a district cooling system. So, big air conditioning system. Uh, in, instead of every building having a, a air conditioning system or every room having a, a room air conditioner, uh, in, in a centralized place, we make chilled water and supply that to different buildings through insulated pipe. And uh, this is a new thing which is... Uh, uh, it has been there from 1930s, but not much been used. Someday in the 2000s to early 2000s, Dubai started doing that and many other countries, many companies came, so cooling as a service. So first time, uh, we have only one project in the whole of India, one DCS plant, which is in Gujarat when Mr. Modi was uh, chief minister, uh, they created a city called the Gift City, Gujarat International Fine Tech City. So they, that's the only place where we have a, a district cooling system. So we now want to do it in all the smart cities and other places. And we have recommended uh, the new parliament, which we are constructing. I told you after 100 years, we are building a new parliament. They are, they are considering it actively. ISGF wrote to a PM office. And in, one, in my letter, this is also another one is, uh, should be a, a, a UAM friendly complex where uh, ministers and uh, members of parliament landing in Delhi airport, they should be able to straight away take a passenger drone and reach the parliament rather than creating trouble on the road for common people with their security and <laughs> convoy. So that is again, I, within within 15 days, I got a reply back from PMO saying that we are seriously considering it. And uh, on the DCS part, they already started uh, consultation with uh, some agencies in Dubai. And uh, on the UAM, after this uh, workshop, we will prepare a report. We will submit that to Nidhi Ayok. Through Nidhi Ayok, we will put up to uh, we'll put, put, put up that to PMO, so the Prime Minister Office. Similarly, in Kerala, uh, while we've been talking for a year to conduct a feasibility study for Bombay and Bangalore, where be better business case is there, and it's one state, at least uh, the multi-state uh, approvals are not required. Still, the, the defense and Navy and all that, that's going to be a major uh, problem. We'll, we'll get around that. So... Uh, in one place, they are doing a metro project, which is not started yet. So, Cochin Airport, that's in the state of Kerala, 
to a uh, northern city to up to Trishur, uh, and that that's in uh, kilometers. That's that's all under 100 kilometers, 60, 70 kilometers. In between another industrial city, Alve. If you try from all that 100 kilometer, you don't know where one town ends and one starts. But they they are trying to do a metro there, and there are already a public opinion that. If you do metro, the already congested traffic will be affected for next three, four years. People will not be able to move around. The entire place will be a big construction yeah. ground. So I spoke to them about uh, introducing UAM. So they are very keen on that. So they would like to uh, know uh, and look at the billions of dollars they need to spend on metro versus uh, introducing a UAM service. Uh, those yeah. who come, uh, a large number of people come from abroad to uh, those who work in Kerala expatriates. They land in Kochi, from Dubai to Kochi, they take uh, less than three hours. From there, going another 100 kilometer takes equal amount of time driving. So many of them have a paying capacity, like Kaniga has mentioned. So the, the Bangalore, Bombay, and this uh, Kochin Trichur uh, uh, routes, we would like to, each, each of those places, there is a clear business case, compelling business case. And we would like to take up that study. That's why we will uh, look forward to uh, collaboration with uh, NASA, uh, your institute, and NARI, uh, Parimals Institute, etc. So, and uh, uh, other experts who are here. Uh, as a next step, what we intend to do is to prepare a report uh, and we will send it to all the panelists for your comment. My colleagues will take Very a to put together some takeaway points, key takeaway points, and uh, send it for your comments and we'll submit that to main. Uh, and also we will share, I believe uh, my colleagues have already shared the draft DGCA order that's uh, unmanned air system uh, rules, uh, which is draft. We have to come and everybody has to come so that it is UAM friendly. So we are also preparing our own comments. So these are uh, the takeaways from uh, our side. Would like to hear from you the closing remarks, John. Yeah, no, so, so thank you, Rishi. I um... You are muted. Oh, excuse me. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, I, I think I'm here. Okay. Um, I uh, listening to your first comments about uh, the, the differing opinions here, and I, and I agree. There are uh, I was hearing uh, positions that were offering different levels of optimism uh, regarding the opportunities here. However, I think when when you look at the things that our speakers are bringing up in common, um, the regulatory challenges. Uh, the noise and emissions opportunities, uh, you know, the displacement of, um, of, of infrastructure from ground uh, to air uh, in terms of the opportunity to, to decongest, um, and plus the research gaps in, in terms of vehicles and, and airspace operations that are not only being understood and addressed here in India, but are also reflective of the work that we've taken on in our own country here in the US, also in, in Eurocontrol and in DLR with our, our earliest speakers, I think there's a, there's a tremendous opportunity here to leverage global learning to float all boats, I think, in, in a very uh, effective manner um, as we look towards a, a, autonomous capabilities for scalability and affordability uh, across all of these challenge spaces. So I, I was very, very impressed with the understanding that uh, the set of panelists that, that you pull together for this, this round table have um, and their insights and the willingness and opportunity here in India uh, to, uh, to be a test bed for a number of these capabilities to learn um, and to allow us to, to build uh, better and safer and more efficient systems you know, around the globe. Uh, it, it was just tremendous and, and really appreciate all the insights of, of everyone that, uh, that, that offered their thoughts. So thank you for allowing me to, to listen in and to, to offer some of my remarks. Uh, but I, I think I, uh, I got the better end of this deal. I've, I've taken a lot of insights away from, from you all in terms of how you're managing this uh, and looking forward to making difference in, in your future. So thank you very, very much. This is great. Sorry, sir, I think you are on mute now. 
Uh, you th- thank you very much and uh, thank you for keeping awake. It's going to be 3 a.m. for you in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and uh, all our other panelists from different places and look forward thank to you. having you all in person in Delhi next year. But before that, we will have a couple of more workshops. Maybe we will do it uh, virtually. Uh, and I'll try to bring in the key decision makers from the go- different government uh, agencies in India and get this uh, going on fast track soon. Uh, thank you to everybody and good day, good night. Thank you all. Bye, Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.